Well, welcome for all of you who are attending this webinar. My name is Zlatko Krislich. I'm with uh, Transportation Planning at the City of Ottawa. And I'll be joined by some of my colleagues, and in particular, Inga Rusendahl, who's going to be speaking to some of the uh, slides at the end of the presentation. So I'm sure that if Sue were able to log on, she'd say hello and introduce me, but we'll have to skip that. We've got a big agenda today, and I think it's probably, uh, we should consider it sort of a teaser for a full day seminar, because it's a lot to cover. And I was really excited about the opportunity to, uh, to speak in, in this sort of a forum because of uh, a speech I heard, a couple talks I heard in Toronto a few weeks ago by Dr. Moet and Dr. Karen Lee, and they talked about health impacts and the built environment. And it made a very strong impression on me, and I wanted to keep building on that theme. I think it might be a very, very important way to kind of get uh, uh, a broader public support moving forward. The other reason I was uh, keen to do it is it seems so far away that it would hardly be any trouble at all from, uh, from that perspective weeks ago. So on the agenda, we've got uh, a few words about cycling in Ottawa just to bring you uh, up to speed in terms of what we're doing here. And uh, also we'll talk about planning and engineering. I think that was one of the main items that was put forward as being of interest. And then finally, we do want to make that connection to public health. So let's look at uh, the recent past, or 2000, 2010. That's when uh, Ottawa became physically much, much larger. We amalgamated, and I think that's uh, a similar circumstance to many Ontario municipalities. And uh, our practice at the time was to add bike lanes when we're building new roads here and there. And we also came out with our first post-amalgamation cycling plan in 2008. And one of the, actually, one of the more uh, important changes was that the responsibility for sort of moving the cycling agenda forward was moved from our operations group, I think it might have been under parking operations, into planning. So it was fairly recent, about uh, two or three years ago. This particular phase, I, I call it our investment phase, and that's why you see a bank there. It's, uh, the, uh, I'll be trying to promote tourism to Ottawa during the talk as well. The, uh, you wouldn't believe how many emails we get from cyclists that say, what's wrong with you people? Don't you know that this bike lane just ends? And the reason for it is that we, our budgets were so low, we couldn't possibly afford to rebuild the road. And so it was an opportunity based. And we end up with a patchwork of facilities uh, across the city. Then came, uh, I would say, a flood of uh, interest, excitement, focus, money, demands for cycling. And it just seemed to come all at once and we start to see some dramatic changes. The photo on the middle on the bottom is our Laurier bike lanes. I believe that was the first segregated facility in a downtown Ontario street. And that's been open now for uh, it's coming up to two years. We've built uh, an expensive uh, pathway along our O-train line to the right there, which we've been waiting well since 1980 to build that. And so now it's gonna be opened in probably two weeks time. And the photo just to the left is our vision of downtown after LRT where a prominent role is played by cycling facilities as well as a much nicer uh, walking environment as you can see. Another important step is that apart from having a patchwork, we picked a really key corridor across the city. It's fully 12 kilometers long and that's gonna be our east-west bikeway and we're going to build a facility virtually the whole length of it, even as one uh, speaker at a recent conference said, even where it hurts. And believe me, some of those places are very painful. And it's not just even money, it's the fact that we've got to move something out of the way and so on. And so this is, this is uh, taking cycling to the level where it's important and we're going to gain space in those parts of the city where, quite frankly, there's not much to be had. And so that is an important step forward. 
We also opened recently in the last couple of years two new rural pathways that full, run fully 20 kilometers to complement one we've had open for about uh, uh, 10 years. It's running sort of to the south and, uh, and west. So that's really opened up uh, important opportunities for rural people to get out in some place where they feel comfortable to walk or cycle. And interestingly enough, in Ontario, although there's big open spaces and fields, there's really no place to walk unless you want to walk by the side of the road. So that was much appreciated. And then finally, you really know when you're making a change when the tourism board decides to brand you as a cycling city. And so just this year, this wonderful video from Ottawa Tourism came out that really introduces people to the city. And fortunately for us, uh, we just got the results um, from our 2011 origin destination survey. That's a huge effort and our gold standard to figure out what people are doing from a transportation point of view. And we're seeing an increase of 40% in cycling rates. That's between 2005 and 2011. So it's kind of reinforcing this idea that uh, we've got some momentum. So we are now in the uh, process of updating all of our master plans and, in, and certainly including uh, transportation and cycling, pedestrian. And that's all under this uh, sort of umbrella of Livable Ottawa. And I wanted to point out that these 12 issues are considered the core issues for the entire process. And it's interesting to see that a majority of them are strongly impacting this question about an active city. And so this is really one of the key issues of this whole uh, planning cycle. And I'll be speaking to some of those ideas. Now, if we jump into the cycling plan, some of the uh, key points, uh, uh, first of all, we really want to get behind the idea of uh, bike transit integration. Uh, some of you may be aware in uh, European cities, you might get 15 to 40 percent of transit trips that start on a bike. Uh, in Ottawa, you'd almost have to say it was uh, unmeasurable. There'd be a few bikes at stations. People just don't use the transit system that way with bikes. And as we're moving to light rail with an investment of over $2 billion, we really want to be able to take advantage of that. Crosstown bikeways, we spoke about that. Uh, the idea is we'll be expanding that across the city with other key corridors, so we finally get some real connected links that are very usable. And also, we are focusing on new kinds of facilities, like segregated facilities, to get the comfort level up talk a bit more about that. Now what about the future? Where are we heading? We are actually challenged by a council in a recent motion to come up with some pretty dramatic cycling modal shares. If you look at that figure 8%, it actually puts us past what most people would consider to be the tipping point. And that's when it's not just the cyclists that think it's a cycling city, but basically everybody sees it. And you'll also notice that there are separate numbers for the city as a whole versus for inside the Greenbelt. And I think that's a really important point we'll be speaking to. After amalgamation, Ottawa truly became a physically vast city, 2,700 plus square kilometers. And obviously, this encompasses a very, very big difference in built form, the way people live, where people live, and how obviously it impacts how they travel. Coming from the same origin destination survey, you can see that this increase in cycling is by no means an even phenomenon. And so that is one of the most serious challenges we face. What you see is in the suburban areas, the cycling rates are hovering around 1% and slowly trending down, whereas in the inside the green belt, the numbers exceed 50% growth. And so this has all kinds of ramifications. Now please uh, note, although the uh, modal share has been dropping, 
very slightly in suburban areas, the absolute rate of cycling goes up. It's just that there's many more people taking more trips by car or other modes uh, since most of our growth is out there. <clears throat> One of the toughest challenges and questions we get is, well, why are we spending all this money on cycling? We're a winter city. If you spend money to build capacity, you still have to double it up because nobody cycles in winter. And obviously, that's not strictly true. A very small number of people do cycle in winter. And we have some interesting numbers for the first time. We can talk about that in a quantitative way. But I wanted to share with you a survey result. Uh, we talk, uh, asked through a survey, we had a response from over 2,000 cyclists and asked them, what do you do in the winter? And as you can see, the majority of them take the bus. And that's an important answer to basically say what we're building with cycling facilities is providing personal mobility for most of the year and then allowing people to make other decisions for, for example, the winter if they can't or won't cycle. And, and I think that's really the big decision point. What kind of a basket can I put on the table to convince you not to buy a car or buy a second car and then I've got far better opportunity to attract you to transit and so on. Once I buy that second car, buy my parking pass downtown, I'm going to sit on a road. I don't care how long it takes. That's the only way I'm going to get to work. So let's talk about uh, how planning and engineering get together, get along. There were some very funny comics and sketches that I could pull from some of the recent conferences, but I, I thought I would stay away from that. I suppose you could say it's um, it's in a, there, there's tension there, and um, and it's and, and let's sort of jump in and talk about what some of the issues are. I actually would see it as 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 being um, a combination of these three things: culture and the lack of a shared vision. And then obviously you go down to things that, that are policy standards and laws. What do I mean by, by culture? Well, we've all heard of uh, people talking about corporate culture and it, it does mean something. I mean, for example, as you can see on the slide here, I think uh, the traffic engineers go to one set of, uh, of seminars and people that are involved in livable cities are said to go to a different set. They hear different stories. Uh, in Ottawa, we happen to be in different buildings. We typically take a different mode on our way to work. And that's, that's part of it. But I think the biggest part of it has to do with what your, what your role is in terms of how it's being reinforced to you day in and day out. And so what ends up happening is we, of course, get comments from people saying, why don't you do more cycling and this and that? And we have the challenge of figuring out how things evolve 10, 28 years in the future. In traffic operations, they do get phone calls and emails and messages from the counselors saying, why am I stuck at this traffic lighting? Why can't you do something? And their mandate, therefore, tends to be that's what, they're, that's what they get the calls about. And it's a tough position for them. And I think my, my, my sort of major suggestion is let's help them deal with that pressure that they're getting from the outside. I want to share with you uh, an article that just came out today in a local paper about Bronson Avenue. It's a place where tragically a cyclist was, was killed and some, um, some intervention was done. Now, our traffic operations, Phil Landry, he was quoted as saying that the focus of our changes were to strike a balance between safety for cyclists, pedestrians, and allowing to traffic to flow on the arterial road. On the other hand, also quoted in this paper was a representative of one of the uh, uh, community groups south of that area who stated, the road is absolutely vital to the south, and uh, we're talking about 50,000 cars per day and 100 or so bicycles. Which one should get the priority? So that's the kind of feedback that they receive day in and day out. Now let's talk about a shared vision. And I think, um, I, I, although 
I mean, I can say that this, this might be a challenge, certainly with other departments like, uh, say, traffic engineers. It's most, most unquestionably a challenge for the vast majority of residents, many councillors. When we come forward and say we see a future where a lot of people cycle, and in some cities you start to talk about that being the majority, in the Ottawa context, particularly as viewed from some of our suburban areas, this seems like a fantasy. They absolutely don't believe it. So we have this disconnect between our official plan, where we're heading, and it's not a question of how fast should we get there and so on and so forth. I mean, a lot of people just don't believe it's going to be possible. The other important point in a shared vision is we have to show where suburban and rural residents are going to see benefit from this. It's going to be different. It won't be the, exactly the same message. And I think often we get a negative reaction from suburban people saying, you don't expect me to cycle all the way to work from, say, Barhaven, which might be 20 kilometers. I mean, a few people do, but there has to be a different story for them. And finally, I think we have to address uh, this, this question of winter right up front because we get that. It's one of the other major uh, sort of doubt points that we have to address. In Ottawa, we, we are taking um, a lot of efforts to start to change that sort of public perception. And what, what we found uh, is that there's a big, big difference between the number of people that are actually cycling in a corridor, let's say, and what everybody thinks the number is, even the cyclists. And it comes from that, you know, that inability of humans to really um, aggregate small numbers into a big number. It's like when you find out that a dripping faucet is 10 billion gallons a week. It's, it doesn't come naturally. It's when you get your visa bill. How did that end up to be $10,000? So what we've been doing is we've been putting up a display beside the Laurier bike lane that shows how many people come by. We've posted those numbers on a website every day, and we actually get quite a bit of media uptake, and we have an event when we hit a milestone, and I continually get people ask, well, how many people do you think? Oh, no way, it can't be that high. And so I think at least we have to share the success we do have and it starts to change people's perception about, is this something that's real? You can also see there on the bottom left, um, uh, three years of dense data that we obtained from our automatic counters, and that's super valuable because uh, cycling being very seasonal weather dependent, it's really hard to get any sensible data on trends from one day counts. So you can see we, we do these counts 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and you can see there a trend over three years. And if we had that for five or six years, I think we'd be convincing people that something's changing in the city. More data, this is, happens to be for the Laurier bike lanes, and you can see how the numbers shift uh, through the season, and the three colors represent three points along the way. We also have a newsletter that goes out to cyclists that just keeps the communication level up. So the other point was, let's talk about the actual rules, guidelines, and policies. I'm not sure, I'm sure all of you have heard about the coroner's report on cycling death, and there's also one recently on pedestrians. And uh, many of you would have uh, noticed that the coroner gave a number of actions to the MTO, and some of those actions were captured within the draft Ontario cycling strategy that was actually announced in Ottawa just before the end of the year. So within that cycling strategy, there's a number of things mentioned. And uh, one of the key things is implication there's going to be a change in the Highway Traffic Act. So let's think about what that means. First of all, you may not be aware, but there's a series of, uh, I don't know if I could call them technical guidance uh, books. These are these things called uh, Book 12, they're OTM, Ontario Traffic Manual. And they are essentially, I would say, the top of the tree engineering authority when anyone is designing a road. If uh, 
they can open up the book and see something there. They're quite comfortable in building it out on the street, even if it's new. And as you can see, there's something called Book 18. And actually, Book 18 is the first time that book has ever been written. And that has to all to do with cycling facilities, typically pavement markings and so on. And so that shows you that it's taken us this long to finally get around to writing a manual. At the same time, uh, we insisted, those of us, and there's municipalities involved in this effort, uh, to also update the signal standards so that we can have bicycle lights. Finally, I wanted to mention OTM Book 15, which has to do with pedestrians. It was recently updated, but there's one component which is still in draft that is not yet released that I think has a lot of implications for pedestrian uh, 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 issues, and we'll talk about that. So all these manuals, uh, first of all, they're in drafts, so we have some work to do. But secondly, we cannot really release them. You can't use them until the necessary changes happen in the Highway Traffic Act. Now, that being said, uh, that's kind of at the Ontario level. But within every city, there are a lot of other guidance documents that then are extremely relevant. I've mentioned we're working on a transportation master plan and cycling plan. Many cities have similar documents. And that's where you'll see uh, policies like, for example, complete streets talked about. However, I think it's extremely important to note that you'll tend to have a more aspirational statements about things like complete streets at that level. And it's extremely important that those elements get bundled in to the more technical documents that talk about what roads are built like and uh, widths of roads and different facilities like that, which actually is what a consultant picks up when they are asked for an assignment to rebuild a road. So that follow through is incredibly important and it's going to take some time here in Ottawa, but of course once we get the policies approved, we're still draft, we'll be moving in that direction. I pulled out a couple of things from these uh, technical references, the OTM books. The first one was a book 15, the type 2 crossing, which again is not yet released. But essentially, it provides the uh, design and essentially some pavement markings and signs that lets a pedestrian cross a road somewhere where there's not a signal for them and gives them the legal right of way to cross that. I remember this uh, summer being in BC, wandering around some town, thinking about crossing a road, and I was startled that all the cars stopped. All these people in these cars that were on important business stopped for me because I looked like I was crossing the road. I got very used to it. It was very nice. So I hope this might bring something like that to, uh, to Ontario. Book 18. That has to do with a lot of cycling-related uh, items. It's actually going to be quite a comprehensive document. And so I just pulled out one example, which is a cross ride. Many of our cities have sort of multi-use cycling pathways at crossroads, and uh, the law right now is uh, we should all stop, get off our bikes, and walk across the intersection. In practice, no one does. So this is an attempt to try and um, line up uh, what people do with uh, good practice and hopefully make it more safer as well by improving uh, related markings and so on. Finally, book 12. Uh, you might think something as simple as putting up a traffic light that everybody understands with a bicycle symbol on it would be pretty easy and you know what could what could the problem be with that? Well that's not legal. The HTA does not allow that. Another good example is um, the HTA does not allow you to ride your bicycle on a paved shoulder in a rural highway because a bicycle, as we all know, under law is a vehicle and vehicles are not allowed to drive in a paved shoulder. So it's a, it's, I don't, I'm not saying anyone's going to get a ticket, but we need to clean all that up and sort of deal with the ambiguities. I think one of the core challenges that we face when we talk about planning, we're going to build cities, build roads, build communities, is some of the assumptions, long-standing assumptions about how we go about deciding how big should a road be, how much capacity 
should we build? And the problem with that is that once you do the math and decide the road needs to be this big, you realistically, certainly in the built-up parts of the city, do not have the opportunity to make that road that big. That just doesn't work if that option's not open to you. The other challenge, let's say you could build a road that's X lanes wide. We know that has negative impacts, and so maybe we don't want to. And certainly when you look through all the engineering documents, many of which were generated in the 60s and guidelines, they don't really address cycling or pedestrian concerns. I think uh, there's some statements that are starting to be shown in there, but there's no math and you can't say, for example, the term that's used for an intersection is that it has failed. The math didn't work out, you have a failure, and that's a hard statement to give to someone. However, we can have intersections that no pedestrian would ever want to cross but all you can say is it's not very nice for pedestrians and it, it doesn't have the same connotation. The other point is, of course, uh, in the planning side, we've got some very aggressive goals to meet. And they require us to not only build facilities, but to change people's behaviors. So we have a lot of challenges to meet. And therefore, for us, we have to get everyone else, including traffic and we, we have to change the city so that's a lot of work to change everyone's opinion. I think the quote below says it, um, says it very succinctly uh, and that's sort of maybe a way to summarize the, the planning view of a road. Now let's go and have a look at the challenges that traffic operations have. Well it's interesting that we can pick the same three things and say that we are for the environment, we are pro-safety, and pro-sustainable transportation, and the planner and the traffic engineer will have a completely opposite um, sort of conclusion out of those three terms. How can that be? Well, of course, we hear about roadway capacity, you need to make the road bigger because obviously if it's not, we get congestion, cars are burning fuel, bad for the environment, uh, city buses are on roads, we have to keep the cars flowing. And they're getting uh, cues, uh, uh, confusing messages. I mean, in the uh, inner area, the residents there tell their councillors, we want to control this traffic, we don't like it, we make the road smaller, but you're not getting, you're getting opposite message from you're getting the opposite message from the suburbs. And that quote below is a great way to summarize the sort of message you get from traffic engineering. Sound engineering principles. And those really are tied around the, the, the car right now. So we, that leaves us with a few uh, conundrums that are very, these are the toughest ones we have to deal with. Uh, First of all, this sort of, we have to get the point across that we simply have to come up with a different way to move people around. And, and it's not that we're going to take away a little bit of capacity to put in a bike lane, because whatever you think you've lost because of that, you're going to be at that same point of congestion. It's just a matter of months or years. It's inevitable because our intensification is, is at least in Ottawa quite, quite significant. So there's no other way to do it. There's no other solution. We have to get people in buses, bikes, and you name it. Secondly, um, many of the routes that we want to put cycling facilities in are routes that are pleasant. Uh, we've got a good active sort of vibe, our traditional main streets, a lot of small businesses. And for them, this issue of trading off a parking spot to put in a cycling facility is something that is absolutely, uh, what's the word I would use, painful to them. And this is something that is a, or one of our biggest challenges to, to change that way of thinking and show them that uh, actually things are changing. The underlying dynamics are changing in terms of how people reach their stores. And finally, something I don't think gets really talked about enough is this sort of generational question. We are making decisions and bets that are going to affect our children even more than us 
And sometimes it's hard to get that argument across. So how's it done today? If we're building a big new condo in what used to be an empty field, we can go to this trip generation handbook. It's a huge thick book and we'll find out in the ground floor there's a certain kind of food restaurant and we can look it up and we'll know how many people go to and from that on an average day. And we add that up for the whole building per square feet and we say here's the number of people that move in and out. We assume to be mostly by cars. And then we need to go look in the road system around there and add the capacity so that when that building gets added, everything will flow and our intersections won't fail. And that's where you get the pressure for adding all these elements that, quite frankly, are almost always negative for the other active modes. And, quite frankly, increasingly inside the Greenbelt, you cannot do any of those anyways for lots of other reasons. Now, I say you cannot do it, but of course, can is a strong word. Um, I wanted to share with you this vision of predict and provide. If downtown Ottawa needed to move a lot of cars, we could, of course, remove an entire block of building and put a 17-lane collector along Laurier. And this was not some crazy idea. This was a dream of all transportation engineers at that time. And it wasn't just uh, the transportation engineers. Um, in a recent article from The Citizen, they looked back through their archives and decided that this was one of the things that thankfully Ottawa didn't do. However, they admitted at the time they were thrilled with it. It was the best idea they'd ever heard of. And so, you know, things can change, attitudes can change, and we obviously, we've seen this in many cities, we don't do this sort of thing anymore, but then how are those attitudes going to start changing as we shift out towards um, other parts of the city? And that's, that's the part we're working on right now. This is an example of one of the engineering guidebooks that uh, talks about, uh, it gives you guidance in terms of, um, how many and how long your turn lane should be. It's a very excellent document. You can do some wonderful simulation there. It's quite accurate. You know how, how long that has to be so that you, know, you minimize the number of times a car stops in a travel lane. And you can see, you can see some of the language there. And then they added this comment in green below, which, which basically is an affirmation that we have to think about pedestrians and cyclists. But there really isn't anything in there that speaks to how you would do that and make those trade-offs. So we're just at the very first step. Now let's look at that same issue from the perspective of a resident um, who sent an email to us uh, in response to our whole process in the transportation master plan. And I think she made it very clear what the downside to that traffic engineering solution was. In this particular case, her and her kids would have to cross 10 lanes, two of which are what they call free flow lanes, and that's a big, big disincentive for her. But let's remember the comment we had from our, our people down at South Hunt Club. You know, you're talking tens of thousands of cars per trip that go through that intersection, and I think the pedestrian counts are certainly less than 100. So how do we make that argument? I think the answer is that we make it by maybe picking locations that aren't as extreme and the good part of the, 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 uh, the, that, that sort of uh, issue is that we actually have made some successes in Ottawa and I hope if uh, some of you are ever here at a conference you can go and look at some of these. We've removed a free flow turn lane in Island Park only for the reason that it makes the crossing easier for pedestrians. Uh, we have some advanced pedestrian signals in uh, one of our shopping areas that the BIA um, had told me they're really worried about those because the drivers might be upset. Once they're in there, they just love them. The BIA loves them and they give the pedestrians six seconds to move on their own without being menaced by turning cars. So I think there's quite a few things we can do if we share these ideas, particularly if they've been implemented in Ontario between ourselves. 
So uh, our uh, policy proposal is around complete streets, as I mentioned before, as my example. And uh, it, it has the same terminology we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll often see uh, in, in these kinds of proposals. But underlying that is a question of how do we really free up the capacity? How do we, how do we balance the equation with engineering? One way to do it is to make the observation that most of our roads, if you imagine a three, four lane major link to a highway through downtown, is really empty almost all the time, except for those peak periods. And so all the calculations we've talked about before about road capacity are usually done at the peak hour, the busiest hour, which means we're building a massive road and all kinds of turn lanes just so that peak hour can be managed, but that is way too much and, is, and all the negative downsides, however, are with us for 24 hours a day. So in Ottawa, we're proposing, why don't we look at a peak period, which is two and a half hours instead of one hour. And that is going to change the mathematics. So when you can say the intersection failed now, it's sometimes like 70% below where it used to. And hopefully that lets us do something different with the space. The other thing we're doing is we're just accepting and, and, and agreeing that we won't get many people cycling unless they feel comfortable, very comfortable. And so we have new kinds of facilities, segregated facilities that we're starting to bring forward. To back that up and to provide some counterpoint to traffic engineering, we're also coming up with a bit of a, let's say, a way to come up with a metric. So we can come to an intersection and we can give you a score, one, two, three, four, and we can say that intersection's failed for the pedestrians. And so that helps um, bring up in, uh, in importance this issue. And we have one for cycling concerns as well as pedestrian. We're very proud of this project because it's the first one where we're going to, from the ground up, you know, Laurier was a retrofit. This one is going to be a brand new road rebuild. We're putting a first bicycle track protected from the traffic. And I was glad to be able to grab this comment done by, partly by uh, Health Canada, that apart from other benefits of doing it, suggests that you have 30% lower particulates if you're in that lane versus on the road as a cyclist. This isn't the only one. We actually have about four projects in the bin, including Laurier, that are going to start to look like this. Again, a sign of a significant change. And to be honest with you, I would say our biggest stress point has been that we don't have OTM book 18 and 12 that tells us how to do it. And so it's been very challenging for us working with traffic engineering. So how can we work together? You know, it's interesting that uh, we can talk about the same positive words between traffic and planning but come up with different answers. I actually think that's very similar when planning speaks to public health and we're talking about safety and this and that but we come up with a very different answer sometimes about whether or not helmets should be mandatory. So here's something though I think we can all get behind which is this idea of reducing speeds, at least default speeds, and even our traffic operations people are behind this. Uh, their caveat is if you want to drop it down to 30, you better physically design the road for that. The sign won't do anything. And this has been pointed out by both the coroner's reports, I believe. I wanted to share with you some excellent work coming from the city of Charlotte where they have gone around and done quite a bit of what's called road diets. They've taken a four lane road, turned it to three lanes where the center lanes for turning. And what they did, uh, which is somewhat unusual, is they did careful measurements of the capacity impacts before and after. You can see those here. The answer is there's hardly any difference. You think you're looking at the same graph. In other words, if I mentioned to you the way that you're driving into work used to be four lanes. I'm going to turn into one lane or two lanes in one direction, now one. You think, wait a second here, I'm not liking that. Well, from a capacity point of view, there's hardly any difference because as we know, people are usually stuck in the left turn lane and that's not usable. 
However, let's look at this graph. What changed radically were the speeds on that road. They dropped dramatically. And so this is a very positive um, result. And speaking with the traffic engineers when I was down there uh, last year, they said that the way to sell it is that all of a sudden the person that defines the characteristics of the road in terms of travel of vehicles is the most prudent driver, not the one who's most impatient and feels they have to go and buzz around everybody as quickly as possible. So let's think about this business of changing people's attitudes First of all, I think the message that you're sharing depends on where you are in terms of cycling rates. At the beginning, um, when there's very, very few people cycling, usually the message is let's keep cyclists safe. There's accidents, we worry about that. Usually some cycling advocates are out there kind of uh, getting the message across. And of course, once you start to get into 15, 20 percent, and, and some cities are, are like that, where cycling is the number one modal share, you talk about transportation efficiency and, and so on, and that's obviously understood by everyone. The hardest place to be is making this jump from 3, 4 percent to 6 to 8 percent. And what's the right message there? I read a paper recently where uh, one researcher said, stop talking about health benefits. Stop talking about the environment. You need to just talk about the efficiency of cycling. I don't think I'm going to win anyone over when they say, well, cycling may be efficient, but nobody does it. So how does that prove to be a way to get them excited? I actually think, based on even my own experience, I think that health message might be the key because that's something we can count on. We know if we get that many people out there cycling, those health benefits are coming. We don't have to convince people that that's not a problem. The other key about cycling is think of the timelines to change uh, an active built environment. We have some wonderful roads like, say, Westboro, where you go shopping and people want to be there. But I was there 20 years ago. You didn't want to be there. Then Mountain Equipment Co-op, move into coffee shops, and we did build a beautiful sidewalk, but I mean, I don't think the sidewalk alone would have done it. It takes time. However, what we've seen in other places like Portland and other cities, if you have the drive and commitment, you can build out a cycling network in 10 years, and you immediately see that response. And you can see this, for example, in Portland. So it's a big impact, and you can do it quickly. The rest of it, you have to sort of move along with a whole lot of other partners. So my final uh, question I'd like to throw out is if I were to be able to promise you, I'm a salesman here, I'm saying I found a way to get 50 to 250,000 people exercising, so 15 million trips a year, I, I can do that for you. What's that worth to someone who's doing public health? Or another way to look at it is how many hockey rinks and mandatory gymnasium classes at work? How else do you do that? You know, what, what are the other ways that work? And if we can convince ourselves, because I don't know if this is really 100% accurate or very interesting, then I think it might be the key angle to, to sort of base these debates on. So uh, I thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, hand over the mic to my colleague Inga. So it's great to uh, have this opportunity to speak with you all and uh, we can, uh, as we just heard, there's, a, there's certainly a great deal con to consider as we collectively move forward on this issue. Um, in speaking from a public health perspective, I thought given the audience today, I wanted to bring up uh, what I think is a really important document that was just released and that certainly uh, relates back to the work that we're uh, speaking around today around active transportation, the built environment and, and issues such as complete streets. There's a new Ministry of Health and should air over here, just one second. There's a new Ministry of Health and Long-Term Plan a uh, strategy that's just been released called Make No Little Plans, Ontario's Public Health Sector Strategic Plan. 
So this is, I think, a great document that sets the tone for the type of work that we are all collectively engaged in. And it uh, begins by highlighting um, the, as, as you all know, the very troublesome rates in childhood and adult uh, obesity, um, and highlights that we really do need to move forward collectively together, building relationships across sectors to increase health promoting complete communities and environments. Most noteworthy in this plan is their strategic goal number four, which uh, specifically outlines the need to promote healthy environments and most notably healthy built environments. Uh, so this is one of the five strategic areas in this plan and um, as such places a really prominent focus on the importance of the work that we're all doing here. The plan recognizes that the capacity to work, to work in this sector varies, uh, varies uh, depending on where we are and that we need to work together to build this capacity as time goes on. So I'm, I'm really pleased to see that um, uh, OPHA took the initiative for this webinar because that really provides us that opportunity to build capacity locally. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. I seem to be missing. Oh, here we go. So in terms of the work that we're doing in Ottawa Public Health, um, we've been engaged in a, in a range of activities and we're very pleased to be working with our partners over in planning as well as uh, with other municipal partners and partners out in the community. Um, in terms of creating sort of broad uh, brush strokes uh, in terms of buckets in which we've been working. One is within the policy and the positioning of uh, healthy communities work and the second is around uh, the work that we're engaged in around health promotion and social marketing. First, um, we recently released a Board of Health report on the built environment and health um, and this report helped us develop an, it developed an overarching framework for OPH for advancing the development of health promoting complete communities um, and it, in, it includes recognizing that OPH can provide an additional line of evidence in support of healthy city planning policies. So this really helps us set the stage. Alongside this board report, we also have a healthy eating active living strategy that sets a comprehensive approach for how we help promote increasing physical activity and active transportation. We're also members of the Healthy Canada by Design Practice Collaborative and I, I hope and, and uh, hope and would imagine that some of our partners across the country are listening uh, in today. So this has been a great opportunity for us to learn from our colleagues across the country and share our learnings with uh, our local colleagues here at the city. We've also been involved in the official plan and master transportation plan reviews, uh, including the cycling plan review. Um, and during the public release or basically the public consultation for the Ottawa um, official plan to master transportation plan called Livable Ottawa, we actually had uh, Dr. David Mowat come and provide a keynote talk on the built environment and health. So this was a wonderful opportunity for us to frame the official plan uh, and its relevance to benefiting public health and population health. In addition, we have a lot of great staff in our uh, public health department, um, auto public health, that provides services through programs like workplace health around active transportation, uh, school health uh, through active and safe routes to schools, uh, for instance. Uh, we have folks in healthy living that work hard at providing events such as physical activity month and uh, active, transportation, active transportation messaging uh, throughout the community and our folks in injury prevention who are doing a lot of work around promoting safe cycling, for instance. All right, one of the other ways in which we've supported our colleagues over in planning uh, is uh, through epidemiological support. Um, we know that cycling has uh, uh, a significant economic health benefit and we set to basically doing a bit of an analysis to demonstrate what the um, economic health benefits would be uh, if we have an increased mode in cycling over time. So for this analysis uh, we based it on the WHO health economic assessment tool um, and estimates the economic benefit due to the decrease in all-cause mortality. So this would be the WHO heat method that was also used in the Toronto Public Health's Road to Health uh, report that many of you will be familiar with. 
In terms of findings, we looked at the potential impact of a 5% increase in mode share. So it should be noted that if we want that 5% increase in mode share, it takes time to achieve and of course the health benefits will, will also take time to be realized. So in the first three years, we came up with an estim estimated economic health benefit of about $2.2 .2 million per year. But if you give it a full five years, by five years when the 5% mode increase share is achieved and the health benefits of cycling have been fully realized, the maximum annual benefit is about $16 million. So this dollar value represents lives saved due to improved health benefits from increased cycling rates. And this, of course, will continue to have ongoing economic benefits. So this is the kind of new partnership that we're engaged uh, with, uh, with our partners in planning. And um, uh, hopefully it will provide them, as well as us, with some information that continues to help make the case as we move forward. So working together, um, uh, as LADCO uh, just spoke, uh, spoke to, um, for each Ontario municipality, planning can generate projections for cycling levels, which we in public health can, help, uh, can use to help assess what the actual health outcomes will be. Um, public health essentially can also provide that level of urgency to the pace of investments in cycling networks through disseminating new research and evidence, through promoting partnerships and collaborations, through integrating health perspectives into built environment decision making. So it really does help, I think the public health perspective really does help contribute to creating an appetite for change and certainly given the growing critical mass both in public health and planning, um, I, I think we can together play a really important role in redefining how we see ourselves moving through our communities um, with cycling as a really legitimate option. So Zlatko, that's the end of my piece and I think we were going to open it to questions. Yes. That's now if you have yeah, the questions we're going to show up on the screen, and I'm, I'm waiting. I'm not sure, uh, Sue, if you're. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. I apologize for my uh, tardy arrival. It, um, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, Daniel, how do you want to field? Questions? Can people should people put them in the chat box, or um, can we unmute people? Um, yes, people can uh, input their questions into the chat box, and we'll take them uh, on a first come first serve basis. Okay, so if uh, anyone out there listening has questions for Inga or Zlatko, and you want to uh, type them into the chat box, um, you can do so. Maybe one, uh, while folks are thinking about that, I have had a question for Inga, actually. Um, you talked about the health and economic assessment tool and um, that you based it on a 5% mode share for cycling. So I assume that means um, for, for uh, purposeful trips to get somewhere versus recreational cycling. Is that is that right? And is there a reason that you chose to use mode share versus just um, measures of cycling activity in general? Uh, yes, it would. I believe it would include uh, recreational and utilitarian. Um, certainly, um, we can uh, connect you with our epidemiologist who did the, the legwork to generate these numbers. Um, what's the second part of your question again, Sue? Sorry. Oh, so I, I just wondered if it included both, and if not, why? If it included what? both the, utilitarian uh, and recreational. Sue. Uh, so, so, um, Probably in this particular case, we're focused on, on the mode share just because we have better numbers for that. But in principle, uh, what we, uh, we can include all trips once we get some idea of the average lengths. In the OD survey, we had good data on the average length of the uh, commuting trips, so we picked only the ones that sort of were long enough to effectively give you a bit of a workout. So that was the reason we picked that we just don't have as much data on the length of the other recreational trips or if you drop to the corner store, it's probably not far enough to get the big impact on health. Right. Daniel, I wonder, um, we're not getting any questions in the chat box. Would it be possible to unmute 
participants and maybe people want to um, just verbally ask their questions. Oh, actually, there are a few questions that are coming in. Oh, there are. I have. I don't see them. So. Oh, I, I see. Don't, how do I do that? Just give me one second here. Okay. Well, um, the, uh, one question that's come in um, says, "And is there any benefit? Uh, let's see. Is there any benefit to introducing a mandatory licensing program for cyclists to help support education and safety? I often see many cyclists on sidewalks traveling." Um, oops. traveling two or three wide on roads, going through red lights, et cetera? Well, it's a, it's a good observation that, uh, for example, we have um, a complimentary program in terms of getting out safety messages to all road users on sharing the road. And one, one thing we know is that we, we can't just start can't only just talk to drivers about what they're doing wrong because we know that the cyclists need to get that message as well. So I do believe it's really more about getting the message out, having them understand these behaviors are a problem. And quite frankly, I think that as we invite the next big cohort of cyclists, they're going to be far more attentive to the rules. And in, in my own experience, when there's four or five of us waiting in an intersection, which is increasingly common, there's a lot better chance we're all waiting for a red light. So I think that's behavior change will take time. We've studied licensing and decided it, it really wasn't going to be beneficial. We'd also like to see the ministry really um, uh, support us in this area very strongly in terms of the education component. All right. Um, we have another question. Um, it says, can you share the complete reference for your health benefits calculation? Is there a report we could consult? Well, I'll leave that uh, to Inga, but I, I think what we'll probably do is when we uh, release our cycling plan, if we uh, show these numbers in it, obviously we'll make sure there's a reference as well, and that's coming out in a few months' time. Yes, and also you can certainly read Toronto Public Health's Road to Health, uh, Improving Walking and Cycling in Toronto report from April 2012, where I think that they did go into a little bit more of a description. And certainly the WHO uh, Health Economic Assessment Tool, does uh, they do have guidelines available for conducting these sorts of analysis. And um, most certainly if, you, if you'd like uh, information in addition to that, then feel free to email uh, Zlatko or myself and we can connect you with our epidemiologist who could provide you with with more background information. This is from Carl. Yeah, it would appear that there is generally more emphasis on the promotion of cycling than on active transport. Example, walking, cycling, other non-motorized forms of transportation. Would you be able to comment on whether or not this is the case? And if so, what is the logic supporting cycling as the priority? Well, we, we, are, uh, we also have an active program in improving pedestrian conditions in a pedestrian plan. I mean, it wasn't the subject of this particular presentation. Otherwise, you would have heard many of the same things. We're focused on the pedestrian level of service. We're making huge investments downtown in improving sidewalks primarily as we introduce uh, our light rail system. I suppose one other observation is that it's just going to take much more time. Uh, we, we have not seen an increase in pedestrian motor share, and it's probably because there's a strong distance and density component to that. So yes, we are investing and we're changing policies to put far more emphasis on pedestrians as well. Okay, um, there's a, a question from John. He asks, has Ottawa considered creating off arterial bike streets as Vancouver has done successfully? Was that, when you say arterial, was that on Ontario or, uh, but I mean, uh, the way I would answer it is the notion of uh, the bikeways that we're going to be introducing in our cycling plan is intended to be these long routes. Uh, so there's that notion of directness, uh, notion of it being a high quality facility. Uh, we do um, also have a guideline that essentially shows you how to build a facility beside a different kind of road. So an arterial would probably have a bike track and also known as a bike bike track or you know we'll, we'll do a multi-use pathway beside it like a bike boulevard let's say. So we do have those ideas as well. Uh, this one's from 
Sarah, uh, do you have a process documented for evaluating design trade-offs for different modes? I would say uh, trade-offs not explicitly. I think in this round what we're going to be doing is we're at least going to be bringing to the table some quantitative uh, numbers around the other modes as well as uh, uh, just uh, cycling. But I don't think we've come up with uh, a sort of a, a normalized point system or an agreement that uh, one half a point here is better than one point there. No, we have not. Uh, we, we, we haven't gotten there yet. But you did talk about developing uh, a sort of um, level of service evaluate, evaluation where you could say whether an intersection, for example, is, is failing for cyclists and pedestrians. Is that true? Yes, that's right. So that, that the, you know, the, the, the reference points we have, the, the scales we're using for bikes and pedestrians, do have the notion of something being unacceptable, just like we do for cars. But then it still becomes a judgment call around the table of, well, how do we actually, you know, what gives, if you will. And so the, we don't have a formula that will tell us, well, here's the one you give up. So uh, I guess that's the step we haven't reached. But at least we do talk around the table, not in terms of uh, things being not as good or worse for pedestrians, but we can say it went, the intersection went from a three to a four. So that's, yeah. that's what's changed. Uh, this is from Jean. Is there any policy statement in the City of Ottawa prioritizing walking and cycling over vehicles? We actually had, I think it was one or two transportation master plans ago that we made the statement about a sort of transportation hierarchy. And I don't know that you'll find those words exactly um, in, in the policies today. I think this notion of complete streets where we've elevated that policy pretty high up states it pretty clearly and then ultimately I think it depends on you know the, the the guidelines below it and also quite frankly the sort of attitudes of the people around the table and their attitudes are built by what they hear around them and so on so I think you know uh, statements and policy aside uh, right now when we come to the table and ask for new facilities for cycling or, or walking we're getting a completely different response than was the case a few years ago and so we have to keep that momentum going. And certainly these policies will help, particularly if they're turned into you know, concrete engineering guides. Uh, Kevin has a question. Did, those, did the cyclists that responded to the survey stating that they don't cycle in winter indicate why? Is it that it's too cold or are there other reasons? For example, not, uh, the bike lanes not being cleared. Um, no, we didn't ask them that. It's an interesting question. I think other surveys and other uh, 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 comments, uh, the way I would describe it is that someone has to make the leap to try it in the winter and then we all agree that we need to keep them as uh, far away from cars as possible and maintain the routes. There was a study done by uh, uh, McGill University that talks about these issues where the biggest sensitivity factor is uh, the condition of the maintenance. So this time around in Ottawa, we're going to be putting together a first proposal for a winter maintained network for cyclists. It'll be very small. And if that's approved, we'll also be monitoring that and, and seeing how that evolves. And I think they're doing the same thing in Montreal. So I think it's a, it's a slow evolution, but uh, we're seeing our numbers on Laurier, where we have uh, two winters worth running between 15 and 20 percent of the numbers we get through the average of what we call the principal cycling period. So it's, it's definitely not a trivial number and we certainly could expect that to grow in time. Great. Uh, from Olivier, since, anemic, uh, since economic health benefits are mainly savings for the provincial government, while municipalities are the ones paying for most of the cycling infrastructure, are you advocating with these numbers for uh, provincial funding for cycling infrastructure? And uh, did you calculate the economic benefits for the municipalities actually paying the bill? Well, I think that, um, first of all, that is something that we are constantly uh, asking, one could say challenging the provincial government to help us more, and we certainly appreciate the work they've done in Book 18 and every other piece of support they've provided. I don't think that we have closed that 
health loop yet. And maybe by coming up with some better numbers, I think, I think that argument becomes even stronger. What I like about it initially is I don't think we have to convince uh, residents in Ottawa that we have a health crisis. I think people get that. And so I, th I think the, the connection we can show even today with what the benefits are, uh, I think that also is very, very effective. But your point is a good one, and I hope we'll get to that next stage at some point. Yeah, I think it's a question that lots of us who uh, advocate on a, on a local level um, can think about because we get that uh, we get that response a lot. Uh, is Ottawa still using the Bixie bike system, and ha has this resulted in, in any measurable increase in mode share? Well, that we're, we have to thank the NCC, and we get wonderful benefit from being the capital thanks to the NCC, and they have uh, introduced a Bixie bike system. It's been stable in terms of bike numbers for the last two years. However. I'm very happy to say that the number of riders has doubled between 2011 and 12. And so last year we had 44,000 people take Bixie trips. And there's great uh, statistics showing what kind of people use it, visitors and so on. Still, that number, 44,000, uh, doesn't change much the macro number in the city, which uh, you know I believe is somewhere in the order of 15 million trips a year. Wow. Okay, I think uh, we've got one more question, and is that, has your strategy included any other infrastructure elements to support cycling? For example, uh, parking, tools, workplaces with showers, um, moving pedestrian push buttons towards the road? Certainly, uh, uh, parking, uh, what we've, we've got support from parking operations. We've been increasing, for example, the ring and post deployment. We've got uh, 300 a year being put out, which is something we never expected that they stepped up with some new money for that. I think we're, we're, we definitely have challenges in getting uh, buildings and uh, building operators to fully accommodate cyclists. I'll give you one small example. We have in our guidelines, uh, just as we talked about, math to figure out how many people come in and out of a building. We have math that figures out how many bike parking spots you need to provide for any particular building. However, we never specified how many were supposed to be short-term and long-term. So a building can be opened up mixed use with a coffee shop in the front and the 32 bike racks are in the basement by the dumpster in P2. It's not helpful. So we are changing our bylaws, uh, our, uh, hopefully this cycle through, to make that a particular point. The other thing we could possibly work on together is that the LEED rules, which a lot of people like to be LEED certified in a building, are really woefully inadequate when it comes to bike parking. Literally, you can just throw a rack in the corner and you're fine for your three points. I think that could also be um, uh, expanded but a little bit of lobby work and that will help us all. Oh, it's um, just about quarter after two so um, I'm wondering if we could we should probably wrap up there are a couple more questions and um, I'm wondering Zlatko if, if we were to send those to you would you be willing to uh, respond to those folks via email to their questions yes I'd be happy to do that okay and I did just get a note from uh, Jackie Gervais who's on the call to uh, let me know that at three o'clock the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycling Professionals is hosting a webinar on the economic benefits of cycling um, and I think Jackie's presenting on that webinar and so is Todd Littman and so if anybody's looking for more information on uh, and, and literature on the economic benefits of walking and cycling Todd's um, got some really great papers on that at his website which is the Victoria Transportation Policy Institute so uh, you might want to have a look there for some more documentation so um, thank you to those of you who are still here I know lots of people had to leave uh, thanks very much Latko and Inga for uh, presenting a really informative webinar that um, provided some great information on what's happening in Ottawa and also I think some some uh, inspiration um, and uh, a little bit of um, background ar around some of the things that uh, engineers are, are uh, tools that they're working with so that we might be able to communicate and, and hopefully come up with similar answers in the future instead of different answers. So um, thanks so much for sharing your experience and your expertise. Well, thank you for setting it up. Thank you.
Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.